Hi, Scott Machine Dad. Welcome back to the channel. As you can see, we're still in 8mm madness. Um, why? In this case, amongst some of the other 8mm things I had, of, I came across uh, two video, two DVDs at a local gun shop in their throwout wave bin for 50 cents. It's the Knob Creek Spring 2005 DVD, um, which I'm sure a lot of my viewers are too young to have ever been there and too young to appreciate how much fun it really was. So this was produced by the Creek, so it's their material. I'm not going to monetize this video. But I dubbed it the best I could, tried to take out the intros and stuff like that. But if you're into, uh, if you were at Knob Creek, first of all, you'll see people on here that have passed. Uh, Kent Lamont's on this tape. Jim Ballou's on this tape. Uh, guys I used to work with the Class 3 Supply even show up in one of the backgrounds. So, I'm done talking. I'm going to take you back to spring of 2005. This is one of the most significant guns, particularly from a U.S. standpoint, used in World War I. This is a French 1914 heavy Hotchkiss gun. It's an 8, eight millimeter label. Shoots from a 24 round metallic feed strip. It's gas operated. Got adjustable gas regulator here. Our first 14 divisions that were, went overseas in World War I were issued this gun. That's a French manufactured gun for which we supplied them the materials. When World War I started, our the entire U.S. inventory of machine guns was only 970 guns. 670 of them were the obsolete 1909 Benet Mercier machine rifle, and there were approximately 230 1904 Colt Maxims and a smattering of Colt potato diggers, all of which were obsolete by the standards of even there in World War I. And so in order to get some guns fast, because the British were, I'm sorry, the French were tooled up making these, we gave them the materials and money and they built us these guns, and we actually fielded them in the, their caliber also, because it was easier than switching. So, interestingly enough, our first 14 divisions fought in World War I using a French manufactured machine gun with French ammunition. Uh, the firearm is extremely heavy, five cooling rings, you know, eight in its cooling, 24 round feed strip. You cock it like this, push the handle forward, shove the feed strip in here. And as you fired it, every time you hit 24, that feed strip would fly out. So if you had a good gun crew, you'd just sit there and keep hooking the feed strips together. You could really crank them. I mean, I've turned them white. It takes about 1,600 rounds continuous, and these rings are white. And you can see the bullets going down the barrel. They just keep running. The receiver is machined out of a block of steel from here to here. Extremely expensive gun to make. It does have a quick change barrel. You just cock it, push this forward, throw a special wrench on here, rotate the barrel, pull it off, throw on another one. Uh, they were issued with about three different tripods. This is the French tripod here. There was a Paris tripod. And then we even manufactured a tripod here with a big round ring on it. It's real heavy. It's called the Cleveland Mount, made in Cleveland, Ohio. It was a very effective gun. It was still used by the French all the way through World War II, and some of the Foreign Legion guys were still using this firearm as late as 1960. Also, the gun, of course, was used. Pancho Villa had a bunch of them in 7 millimeter Mauser. They were used by a lot of South American countries in 7mm Mausers, 7.65 Argentine. Uh, uh, there was even a couple I saw pictures of chambered in 7.65 Italian. The Italians were using them. Uh, Landy's had one over here chambered in 303 British, which is interesting. So they've been chambered in quite a few calibers. But the largest manufacturer of them was World War I for us and World War I for the French. And as I mentioned, the French used the same rig all the way throughout World War II. Hi, my name is Kent Lamont. I'm here to talk about the German LMG, or I'm sorry, the German 0815 Maxim gun. This gun was fielded in 1915 or 16. It's a lightened version of the heavy 08 Maxim. The, uh, when the Germans overran Belgium, the Belgians were using Lewis guns made in Belgium. And the Lewis guns weighed about 32 pounds, shot 47 rounds, pan fed, 303 gas operated gun. And it was a lot more maneuverable and lighter than the heavy Maxim. The heavy Maxim on the sled weighed about 150 or 60 pounds. The uh, Lewis gun weighed about 32 pounds. And they called them the Belgian rattlesnake. They thought it was unfair for guys to sneak up on them and shoot them. So anyway, they designed a lightened Maxim gun. They took their heavy 08 Maxim gun, put a buttstock on it, smaller diameter water jacket, thinner material, smaller side plates and height. They reduced the diameter of, from four millimeters to three millimeters on the plate thickness. 
hung a hundred round drum on it, which you wound a hundred rounds of eight by 57 Mauser and a belt on it. Stuck a sling on it, filled it full of water, stuck it over their shoulder and charged. They weighed about 65 pounds loaded and they called it a light machine gun. These guys were tougher than we are today. Light machine gun today might be 10 or 12, 13, 14 pounds. They made approximately 120,000 of them during the war. There were seven different manufacturers. The least one was uh, was DWM, which manufactured 2,000, and I don't remember you know the, the exact numbers on the others, but the total was 120,000, and it was a lightened maxim. Every part in it is different except use the same lock, which you can change real fast if you break something in these guns. They're all water-cooled, cyclic rate about five or 600 RPM, and they were pretty effective if you didn't mind packing all that weight. Um, they had their course filled with water, snap a water hose on here, and if you got them hot, you'd stick the end of the hose under water in a container. The main reason was you didn't have a plume of steam flying up, which would give away your position. You know, somebody would zero in on you with a French 75 and take you out. The reason we see so many of them here is during World War I, whenever you bought a certain quantity of war bonds, they would give you either an 08 Maxim or an 08 15 Maxim, and they gave a, a, approximately 7,000 these Maxim guns out to people. You know, that nurse Florence Nightingale got seven or eight of them, and one uh, senator got, I believe I got 15 of them from one senator, you know, who was a senator during World War II, and then he'd written them a letter said, don't give me any more Maxim guns, and he got some other neat stuff. They're not workers and great big artillery shells and things for every so many war bonds that he purchased. And um, the gun was further fielded in World War II. They utilized it. They changed it a little. They moved the bipod from the rear to the front. They put on a 08 type uh, uh, water valve up front. They put anti-aircraft states that would snap here on the side. You could pop them off, stick them on here and they were supposedly used for home, homeland defense. The ammunition is eight by 57 miles, or it's eight millimeter caliber, 323 diameter, 57 millimeters long, loaded onto a, on this gun, a 100 round web belt, which you'd start on three metal tabs right here, then you'd wind this, you'd wind it around the right direction, which I never can get right, but anyway. Anyway, then you close this little ratchety handle, which will hold it, then you close this thing, you got this tab sticking out, you stick it through here, stick it back on the gun, hold the gun back, pull it in once, half loads it, bring it back, pull it in again, and you're ready, ready to blast. And uh, also, to release it, to shoot it, this little ratchety thing is to keep it from falling out when you're carrying You're ready to shoot, flip it straight out so that it'll freewheel that spool in there. I mean, I've carried them and tried it. You know, 200 yards, you want to sit down, get a glass of water, and hope you don't have to run. They had to be some tough guys to pack these in the mud, especially on lousy food and short rations and cold weather and being tired. Because as they are right here, they're heavy. But by the time you add a 10 pound belt of ammo, you'll hang the sling on it, put in about, uh, you'd be putting in about uh, 12 pounds of water. You know, it'd be a pretty heavy proposition.
Welcome to the Spring Knob Creek 2005 video. We're continuing our uh, theme of World War I firearms. I have here one of the finest productions of John Moses Browning. This is the Browning automatic rifle model of 1918. You have to understand, John Moses Browning was a genius. He was a leader in Otto da Vinci of firearms. He produced so many weapons that are used in the United States military that up until today, we're still using his design. If you go to Iraq today and take the M240B, uh, the M240 Golf, it uses the exact same lock mechanism that John Moses designed back in 1917. This is something that you don't see produced today. Look at the quality of this piece. Now I'm gonna turn this around a little bit so you can see. You have checkered walnut, checkered walnut stock, checkered walnut forend, Oh, it makes this weapon unusual. There were three producers of BARs in World War I. It was Colt, Winchester, and Marlon Rockwell. Colt developed the weapon under the auspices of John Moses Browning. However, Winchester was the first one to get into production. This particular piece was made in two, which is February of 1918. I have to explain something to you. When this gun was actually adopted by the United States government, it was May of 1917. They had two weapons under consideration, the belt-fed Browning and the Browning automatic rifle. So how do you distinguish between the two? They said, okay, we're going to call the belt-fed the 1917, and we're going to call the BAR rifle the 1918. So this is the model of 1918. You can see what we have is a blued flash hider, it's made to be fired by one man. I'm going to stand up and show you a little bit about the way it's fired. You taught a technique, you'd raise your sight. Interestingly enough, if you know anything about um, 1917 Enfields, you notice that contour of the rear sight is identical to the 1917 Enfield rifle. When you fire it, you can even fire it in anti-aircraft mode. Your, your foot is braced forward, and now you have complete control over the piece. And that's how it's fired, it's a Browning automatic rifle. Remember, it was designed to be fired by one man. However, it was serviced by a group of three people. One man who was a BAR man, it was an assistant BAR man whose job it was to carry more magazines, and a second assistant BAR man. And of course, all of them were cross-trained. If something happened to the first guy, the second guy would take over. The gun was fired, from a 20 round box magazine. Now they actually developed a 40 round box magazine and my research showed that they actually made a 30 round box magazine. Say, so wouldn't that have been wonderful if they had a 50 round drum for this thing? Well the problem is, you fire a 20 round magazine out of this weapon, I guarantee you, if you touch the top of this barrel, you're gonna burn your fingers to the bone. That's why they have such a large handguard on here.
is, this is one of the most significant guns, particularly from a U.S. standpoint, used in World War I. This is a French 1914 heavy Hotchkiss gun. It's an 8, eight millimeter Lebel. Shoots from a 24 round metallic feed strip. It's gas operated. Okay, adjustable gas regulator here. Our first 14 divisions that were, went overseas in World War I were issued this gun. That's a French manufactured gun for which we supplied them the materials. When World War I started, our the entire U.S. inventory of machine guns was only 970 guns. 670 of them were the obsolete 1909 Benet Mercier machine rifle. And there were approximately 230 1904 Colt Maxims and a smattering of Colt potato diggers, all of which were obsolete by the standards of even there in World War I. And so in order to get some guns fast, because the British were, I'm sorry, the French were tooled up making these, we gave them the materials and money, and they built us these guns. And we actually fielded them in the, their caliber also, because it was easier than switching. So interestingly enough, our first 14 divisions fought in World War I using a French manufactured machine gun with French ammunition. Now uh, the firearm is extremely heavy, five cooling rings, you know, eight in its cooling, 24 round feed strip. You cock it like this, push the handle forward, shove the feed strip in here. And as you fired it, every time you hit 24, that feed strip would fly out. So if you had a good gun crew, you'd just sit there and keep hooking the feed strips together. You could really crank them. I mean, I've turned them white. It takes about 1,600 rounds continuous, and these rings are white, and you can see the bullets going down the barrel. They just keep running. The receiver's machined out of a block of steel from here to here. Extremely expensive gun to make. It does have a quick change barrel. You just cock it, push this forward, throw a special wrench on here, rotate the barrel, pull it off, throw on another one. Uh, they were issued with about three different tripods. This is the French tripod here. There was a Paris tripod. And then we even manufactured a tripod here with a big round ring on it. It's real heavy. It's called the Cleveland Mount, made in Cleveland, Ohio. It was a very effective gun. It was still used by the French all the way through World War II and some of the Foreign Legion guys we're still using this firearm as late as 1960. Also, the gun, of course, was used. Pancho Villa had a bunch of them in 7 millimeter Mauser. They were used by a lot of South American countries in 7 millimeter Mauser, 7.65 Argentine. Uh, uh, there was even a couple I saw pictures of chambered in 7.65 Italian. The Italians were using them. Uh, Landy's had one over here chambered in 303 British, which is interesting. So they've been chambered in quite a few calibers, but the largest manufacturer of them was. World War I for us and World War I for the French. And as I mentioned, the French used the same rig all the way throughout World War II. Hi, my name is Kent Lamont. I'm here to talk about the German LMG, or I'm sorry, the German 0815 Maxim gun. This gun was fielded in 1915 or 16. It's a lightened version of the heavy 08 Maxim. The, uh, when the Germans overran Belgium, the Belgians were using Lewis guns made in Belgium. And the Lewis guns weighed about 32 pounds, shot 47 rounds, pan-fed, 303 gas-operated gun. It was a lot more maneuverable and lighter than the heavy Maxim. The heavy Maxim on the sled weighed about 150 or 60 pounds. The uh, Lewis gun weighed about 32 pounds. And they called them the Belgian rattlesnake. They thought it was unfair for guys to sneak up on them and shoot them. So anyway, they designed a lightened Maxim gun. They took their heavy 08 Maxim gun, put a butt stock on it, smaller diameter water jacket, thinner material, smaller side plates and height. They reduced the diameter of, from four millimeters to three millimeters on the plate thickness, hung a hundred round drum on it, which you wound a hundred rounds of eight by 57 Mauser and a belt on it. Stuck a sling on it, filled it full of water, stuck it over their shoulder and charged. They weighed about 65 pounds loaded and they called it a light machine gun. These guys were tougher than we are today. Light machine gun today might be 10 or 12, 13, 14 pounds. They made approximately 120,000 of them during the war. There were seven different manufacturers. The least one was uh, was DWM, which manufactured 2,000, and I don't remember you know the, the exact numbers on the others, but the total was 120,000, and it was a lightened maxim. Every part in it is different except use the same lock which you can change real fast if you break something in these guns. They're all water-cooled, cyclic rate about five or 600 RPM. And they were pretty effective if you didn't mind packing all that weight. Um, they had their course filled with water, snap a water hose on here, and if you got them hot, you'd stick the end of the hose under water in a container. The main reason was you didn't have a plume of steam flying up, which would give away your position. You know, and somebody'd zero in on you with a French 75 and take you out. 
the reason we see so many of them here is during World War I, whenever you bought a certain quantity of war bonds, they would give you either an 08 Maxim or an 08 15 Maxim, and they gave a, a, approximately 7,000 of these Maxim guns out to people. You know that nurse Florence Nightingale got seven or eight of them, and one uh, senator got, I believe I got 15 of them from one senator, you know, who was a senator during World War II, and then he'd written them a letter, said, don't give me any more Maxim guns, and he got some other neat stuff, they're not workers and great big artillery shells and things for every so many war bonds that he purchased. And um, the gun was further fielded in World War II. They utilized it, they changed it a little, they moved the bipod from the rear to the front. They put on a 08 type uh, uh, water valve up front. They put anti-aircraft sites that would snap here on the side, you could pop them off, stick them on here. And they were supposedly used for home homeland defense. The ammunition is 8 by 57 Mauser, it's 8 millimeter caliber, 323 diameter, 57 millimeters long. Loaded onto a, on this gun, a 100 round web belt, which you'd start on three metal tabs right here. Then you'd wind this, you'd wind it around the right direction, which I never can get right, but anyway. Anyway, then you close this little ratchety handle, which will hold it, and you close this thing. You got this tab sticking out, you stick it through here, stick it back on the gun, Hold the gun back, pull it in once, half loads it, bring it back, pull it in again, and you're ready, ready to blast. And uh, also to release it, to shoot it, this little ratchety thing is to keep it from falling out when you're carrying it, ready to shoot, flip it straight out so that that'll freewheel that spool in there. I mean, I've carried them and tried it, you know, 200 yards, you want to sit down and get a glass of water and hope you don't have to run. There had to be some tough guys to pack these in the mud, especially on lousy food and short rations and cold weather and being tired. Because as they are right here, they're heavy. But by the time you add a 10 pound belt of ammo, you'll hang the sling on it, put in about, uh, you'd be putting in about uh, 12 pounds of water. You know, it'd be a pretty heavy proposition.
Welcome to the Spring Knob Creek 2005 video. We're continuing our uh, theme of World War I firearms. I have here one of the finest productions of John Moses Browning. This is the Browning automatic rifle model of 1918. You have to understand, John Moses Browning was a genius. He was a leader in Otto da Vinci of firearms. He produced so many weapons that are used in the United States military that up until today, we're still using his design. If you go to Iraq today and take the M240B, uh, the M240 Golf, it uses the exact same lock mechanism that John Moses designed back in 1917. Now let me go back and talk a little bit about history. We're talking about World War I, and, and now it's kind of a memory, it's fading in a lot of people's minds. World War I was a horrible war of attrition. It boiled down to two sides. You had the British and the French on one side, and the Germans and the Austrians on the other side. The British and French, of course, were the Allies, and the, uh, the Germans and the Austrians were known as the Central Powers. It actually ended up a stalemate, because they had two parallel trenches running all the way from Belgium right up on, almost to Norway, and nothing was moving. There was a stalemate. They would send guys over the, over the top, which, which was the expression of the time, and people were just being mowed down by Maxim machine guns, Vickers machine guns, and the whole thing was a static situation. Some far-thinking individuals said, oh, wait a minute, we need a way to break that stalemate. So the French developed a weapon called the Show Show, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes, which was a, a one-man machine gun, light machine gun, which we developed into what we call a squad automatic weapon. This is a squad automatic weapon. As this was developed, it was developed as a machine rifle. This is a fine rifle. It has one characteristic which makes it unusual. It is fully automatic. John Moses Browning designed this. And the way it really works, if you look at the hump that's right here, there's a little toggle that locks into place. It fires fully automatic or semi-automatic. Now, if I have this set properly, okay, watch what, what's going to happen when I pull this trigger. The bolt is going to go forward, fire a cartridge, the gas is going to come out here, push against the piston, and work the action in a fully automatic method. Or you may set it for semi-automatic, in which case it will fire one shot and then re recock itself. This is something that you don't see produced today. Look at the quality of this piece. Now I'm going to turn this around a little bit so you can see. You have checkered walnut, checkered walnut stock, checkered walnut forend. Well, what makes this weapon unusual? There were three producers of BARs in World War I. It was Colt, Winchester, and Marlon Rockwell. Colt developed the weapon under the auspices of John Moses Browning. However, Winchester was the first one to get into production. This particular piece was made in 2, which is February of 1918. I have to explain something to you. When this gun was actually adopted by the United States government, it was May of 1917. They had two weapons under consideration, the belt-fed Browning and the Browning automatic rifle. So how do you distinguish between the two? They said, okay, we're going to call the belt-fed the 1917, and we're going to call the BAR rifle the 1918. So this is the model of 1918. You can see what we have is a blued flash hider. It's made to be fired by one man. I'm going to stand up and show you a little bit about the way it's fired. You taught a technique, you'd raise your sight. Interestingly enough, if you know anything about um, 1917 Enfields, you notice that contour of the rear sight is identical to the 1917 Enfield rifle. When you fire it, you can even fire it in anti-aircraft mode. Your, your foot is braced forward, and now you have complete control over the piece. And that's how it's fired, it's a Browning automatic rifle. Remember, it was designed to be fired by one man. However, it was serviced by a group of three people. One man who was a BAR man. It was an assistant BAR man whose job it was to carry more magazines, and a second assistant BAR man. And of course, all of them were cross-trained. If something happened to the first guy, the second guy would take over. The gun was fired. From a 20-round box magazine. 
Now, they actually developed a 40-round box magazine, and my research showed that they actually made a 30-round box magazine. Say, so wouldn't it have been wonderful if they had a 50-round drum for this thing? Well, the problem is, you fire a 20-round magazine out of this weapon, I guarantee you, if you touch the top of this barrel, you're going to burn your fingers to the bone. That's why they have such a large handguard on here. Now, the idea of the squad automatic weapon was the men would go out in groups and try to get behind the enemy lines or through the enemy lines and do damage. And that's what this was designed for. This is a one-man... Now, this was called a couple of things. It was called a Browning automatic rifle, but it was also called a Browning machine rifle, fully automatic. Now, I don't know if I, can, if I should go over the, the details of the lock mechanism. I think if I do this right, you can see it. You see this little piece right here? Can you get that little piece? Watch when I let it go forward a little bit. See it go up into the receiver? It locks into place. That's how the thing works. This weapon is designed so that it goes very smoothly. It goes back and forth. It doesn't kick at all. In fact, a female can fire this, fire, this thing with no problem whatsoever. I've seen some very fine women. In fact, uh, Bob Landy's daughter fires this one very, very well. Uh, I first of all want to thank Kent Lamont, who gave me this, well, yeah, he's given it to me. It says, brought this fine example of a Marlin Rockwell. My speculation is that this is a presentation piece. And I'll tell you why. When you look at the top piece, it's marked Browning Ma Machine Rifle, U.S. model of 1918. Then you see manufactured by Marlin Rockwell and Company. Now, those of you who know tools, you know who Marlin Rockwell is, the Rockwell hardness uh, scale. But the number is 99,999. Now, that type of rifle usually is set aside for special presentation, either to the president or somebody that was uh, high up in the comp company. But you don't see an example of something like this, just the bluing. Look at the checkering, the, fine, the coarseness of the checkering to make you hold on to the piece. As I've explained, the barrel, the gases from the bullet go up here, they're bled off of here and push on a piston, which works the weapon back and forth. Browning automatic rifle, model of 1918, a weapon to help break the stalemate of the trenches. A few moments ago, I showed you the finest example of a squad automatic weapon produced in World War I. Now I'd like to show you the worst example and probably the world's worst machine gun. This is a 1915 model French show show. Now that is spelled C-H-A-U-C-H-A-T. Now French is funny. If in the normal chat, I think we call it chow chat, but the actual name is show show. Now, a lot of people said this is the world's worst machine gun, but interestingly enough, this particular gun was very innovative of its time. It was the French who developed this, again, to try to break that stalemate of the, the trench line. Again, think of the trenches a few hundred yards apart, and nobody's moving. When they go over the top, they get mowed down by machine guns. Somebody got the concept of walking fire. What they did was they got a bunch of guys with one of these, each one with one of these things, and they would march across no man's land, and every time their left foot fit, hit the ground, they'd fire a burst. Well, of course, they still get mowed down, but it developed, again, a squad automatic fun concept. A squad of men with a handheld light machine gun capable of sustained fire. The only problem is, this was a design by Piper, which is what's called a recoil-operated weapon, which means this whole thing is going to go forward, and when it does, Everything's going to move around. Believe it or not, there's aluminum in this gun. And at that time, aluminum was extremely valuable. Probably its worst part is the magazine. Now, here we have a nice 30-round magazine. But here's a problem. World War I was fought in the trenches. And in the trenches, you had nothing but mud, lice, and bugs, and rats. And every time you loaded one of these magazines, you'd end up with dirt or mud or whatever near to jam it. I'll tell you a story, the first time I got to, I got to fire about 300 rounds for one of these things, one Knob Creek down here, well, about 10 or 15 years ago. And my poor wife loaded these magazines. She not only cut her fingers, but she had to have a manicure afterwards. So she always complained to me about this particular gun. She really didn't want to use it. It's about 25 pounds, 
It has a bipod made to be fired for the prone, but I'm going to tell you when it fires you, it really hammers the hell out of your shoulder. You're not really comfortable shooting it. When you fire it from the hip, which is what I did, I ended up breaking the watch crystal on my watch. This is still called the world's worst machine gun. But what I tell people, you're going to stop and figure, this was a gun that was made 90 years ago. It had a cartridge called the 8mm LaBelle, which was a rifle cartridge at the time. Most of the people who buy these things buy them as what are called DWATs, deactivated watch rifles. This particular weapon was welded during the amnesty and sold with no paperwork. And then the amnesty in 1986 came along and the guns got registered. These things became more valuable. Very few people bother to reactivate this gun. First of all, the ammunition is hard to come by. It's dangerous to fire. In fact, I don't know if you can see very well on my arm, I have a nice scar from an 8mm LaBelle Hotchkiss. When that thing went off, I had a hang fire, waited the appropriate, appropriate time, pulled the operating handle back, and I heard pop, and I saw blood spurting out of my arm. 8mm LaBelle, because it was old and stored, would hang fire. In other words, it would You'd fire the weapon, you'd fire the round, and there'd be a, like a sizzling inside. It'd take maybe maybe eight to ten, in this case, 30 seconds before that thing finally popped off. Well, here's the worst of it. We got stuck with it. We're in World, we went into World War I, of course, in 1917, 1918. The war had been going on since 1914. Our boys went over with beautiful BARs, just like I showed you a few minutes ago. They took the BARs away from them. This is, this is by order of General Blackjack Pershing, because he was afraid the Germans might capture them and, and produce it. It was such a beautiful weapon. And they ended up giving them these pieces of garbage. And I'll tell you, the boys in the trenches were not too happy ending up with this weapon. They even developed this weapon, I believe in 1915, in .30-06. And you know, I'm, I'm game to fire just about any weapon in the world, but I'm not going to fire this weapon in .30-06, because I want to keep my head.